We are in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27 this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Last week we covered verse 25 pretty extensively. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. The command, husbands, love your wives, that clear command, and you're to obey that command just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church, for her. And we talked about how Christ loved this church. Before the foundation of the world, he loved us. While we were yet dead in our trespasses and sins, he loved us. We talked about Christ in heaven and eternity past and the incarnation and how he surrendered, he gave up. The word was kenosis. He emptied himself of his privileges and his advantages as God and gave himself up to the Father and entrusted the Father with all of those things to empower him by the Holy Spirit as he became a man, he became a slave of God. And he became obedient to death. Why? Because he loves his church. Does that not comfort you this morning that he did this because he loves his church? And not just any death. Death on a cross, the death of a blasphemer, the death of a violent criminal, the death of a thief, the death of a murderer, the worst death. But that wasn't the worst of it. We talked about how Christ drank down the wrath of God for the church. And I hope that touched your heart last week, that Christ took your hell. If you are in Christ, he took the hell that you deserve, the wrath of God that you deserve, and he took it all upon himself. Christ suffered for his church. I want to point out this morning that Christ did not suffer for his church without purpose. It was not a meaningless suffering. Too often I have heard of people who have been counseled by whether marriage counselors in the church or pastors in the church who are told Christ suffered and so your marriage is suffering so just go home and suffer and suffer well without any purpose or meaning to that suffering. Christ didn't suffer for nothing. Christ suffered for a purpose. If we're going to encourage someone in, in a situation where they are suffering, let's make sure we understand why they are suffering, what the purpose is, that there's a reason for this. Because Christ suffered for a reason, for a purpose. In fact, Paul here in verses 26 through 27 gives us three reasons which are closely linked together. Back when we were in Ephesians chapter 3, covering the prayer of Paul. We talked about, and some of you may remember this if you were here, we talked about the henna clauses. Henna clauses. That word henna is usually translated that or so that. It's a purpose statement, a henna clause is. And we gave the three reasons Paul prayed that prayer, the three purposes Paul prayed that prayer for the church. Well, here we see once again three henna clauses that Paul gives for the love of Christ for his church, the reasons Christ loves his church and gave himself up for the church. And Paul lays that out. And husbands, you are to love your wives for the same reasons Christ loves and has loved his church. And so let's take a look at those reasons. The first one is found in verse 26. So that, that's the word hina in the Greek, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might sanctify her. And actually, each one of these clauses have to do with that sanctification. Each one of them do, but each one of them come from a different aspect. It's a progression that Paul is doing here. What does it mean to be sanctified? We should understand that word, sanctified. What's it mean to be sanctified? Let me tell you this. It's very simple. It's being set apart for God. It's that simple. Being set apart for God. That's what sanctify means. 
Now, you can be sanctified for more than just one thing. Sanctification just means you're set apart to God, but it may be for various purposes. For example, in John chapter 17, verse 19, Christ said, I sanctify myself. Well, I needed sanctification because I needed to be changed. <laughs> Does Christ need to be changed? <laughs> no. What does it mean that he says, I sanctify myself? What did he set himself apart for? We just talked about it. To drink the wrath of the church. He sanctified himself to sanctify a people. He set himself apart to drink down the wrath of God. Praise God, that's not what he's sanctifying us for. In fact, that's what he's taking away from us, is the wrath of God. And that's what he did in his own sanctification, was he took the wrath of God that we deserved upon himself on the cross. In 1 Corinthians 7, we see another sanctification. This is one's very interesting. We're not going to turn there. But you have a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse. Most likely, two people who were unbelievers and one came to Christ because we're not supposed to, as believers, marry unbelievers. And so most likely in this situation, you had two spouses that were unbelievers. One becomes a believer, the other does not. And Paul gives them instructions. And one of the things he says is that that unbeliever is sanctified by the believing spouse. So what's that mean? Well, they're not saved because they're an unbeliever. Does that make sense? They, they can't be a Christian. They don't believe. So it's not salvation. Well, how are they sanctified? Well, because there is a believing spouse in that marriage, there's a sanctification of that marriage. And we know from just recent sermons as well as next week and maybe even a little bit this week that the two become what? One in marriage. And so since they're one, there's a blessing on that marriage for the believer. They're set apart for that blessing as a couple. That doesn't mean that they receive salvation, but they receive a special grace in that setting apart of that marriage because one is a believer. And so understand that sanctification doesn't always necessarily have to mean what you automatically think of. There, there's different aspects of sanctification or can be used in different ways. So what is Paul using it here for in this text in verse 26? I'm going to demonstrate to you that he's talking about positional sanctification. Now, that's just a theological word, and I'll explain that and help you understand that in a minute. But he's talking about positional sanctification, which really is our salvation. Look at it with me a little bit. Verse 26, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That word cleansed means to be made clean, to be made clean. In the sense that there's no sin that can stick to this person. They're so clean. The word washing with water, many have thought, well, that must be baptism. It's not. <laughs> it's not. When baptism doesn't cleanse you from your sin. Baptism of the Holy Spirit can cleanse you from your sin, but not with water. Water is a testi testimony. You're testifying and identifying with Christ and his church when we get baptized. But that doesn't bring us salvation. He's not talking about baptism. The word there actually in the Greek is lutron, which has to do with washing, but it's only used twice in the New Testament. The other place that it's used is in the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 5. And this is, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it for you, but this is how Paul uses it there. He saved us, not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing, the lutron of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. That's the only other place that word is used in the New Testament. And it definitely there is clear he's speaking of salvation. Regeneration of the Holy Spirit. As the Spirit makes us alive, makes us a new creation. The washing of water. The, the reason he uses that washing of water is that's what they washed with. That was the agent that they used to clean themselves with. But it's just a metaphor. It's a metaphor for this, washing of water with the word or of the word. We read in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes from hearing 
And hearing by what? The word of Christ or the word of God. Faith comes by the word. God's ordained means to save people. Yes, it's by the Holy Spirit making them alive, but his ordained means is that the word of God is spoken out, is preached out, is lived out, but spoken out so that people who cannot hear, who cannot see, who are dead, the spirit opens their eyes and opens their ears, makes them alive, and they receive that word because the spirit makes them alive and able to receive that word. God's ordained means to save people is the Holy Spirit using his word to save people. That is why we are commanded to make disciples, to make learners, to teach the word of God. Because that is God's ordained means of saving people. It's God's ordained means of changing people. Is the word of God. I don't think I have to go on and on about that because I've preached about that so many times the last number of weeks and even months about the fact that it's the word of Christ that dwells in us richly that changes us, but it's that word of Christ initially that the Holy Spirit used that word of the gospel to open your eyes, to be saved. And in that moment, you are set apart for God, set apart to God. I want us to know, too, that this cleansing, this making clean, you know, oftentimes we think of our sins being forgiven, and that's good. They are if you are in Christ. Your sins are gone. Your sins are are forgiven, but it's greater than that. It's greater than just that. Let me read just some scripture for you. Psalm 103, verse 12. Many of you are going to recognize this. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Hebrews 8, 12, which is a repetition of Jeremiah chapter 31, says this. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. God chooses to forget it. Not just forgive it, but to forget it. Isaiah 38, 17. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Can you see them if they're back there? He cannot see them. They're behind him. Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19 says this. Who is a God like you, who forgives iniquity and passes over the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? He does not hold fast to his anger forever because he delights in loving kindness. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Have you ever been into the depths of the sea? No, because you go down there, you die. <laughs> Those sins are gone, removed. Colossians 2, verse 14 says this, therefore, I'm sorry, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he also has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It's more than just forgiveness, it's removal of sin. It's gone. All of your sin when you come into Christ is gone. All of your sin when you come to Christ is gone. The sin you committed before you came to Christ, the sin you're going to commit after you came to Christ, the sin you're going to commit tomorrow, the sin you committed yesterday, it is gone. You're clean. This is so important. This is so important because if we don't understand Romans 8, 1, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, we will live as guilty, shameful people, and a guilty, shameful person never proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ because they don't understand 
that it's been removed. And so they, they don't trust in it fully in that sense. They won't proclaim it to somebody else saying, you can have your sins removed. Will they? But if you know my sin is gone and you meet a wretched sinner, you know what? You're going to be like, your sin can be gone too. And you'll never think for a moment that anyone is beyond his great salvation. Christian, it's so important that you understand your sin is gone. Not just, not just forgiven, cleansed, clean. God looks at you and he sees you sinlessly. Praise God for that. This is what is called positional sanctification. Positional sanctification. Let me try to illustrate that a little bit for you. I think we should start a baseball team. And I want Rex Sr. there to be my pitcher. So Rex is going to be the pitcher of the baseball team. I don't know how Rex throws. I don't have a clue. He might throw like a girl for all I know. <laughs> no offense to the ladies. Maybe I'll make Bonnie my pitcher instead of Rex then. No. <laughs> I'm going to make Rex the pitcher. I'm going to give him the position of pitcher. And let's say Rex can't, can't throw a ball. Maybe, maybe age has caught up with him finally. <laughs> and his shoulder doesn't work anymore. And he just, I don't know, but let's say, he, let's say he struggles with pitching. But if we give Rex the position of pitcher, Rex is our pitcher. Doesn't matter whether he can throw the ball. That, that's immaterial. He's our pitcher. Now, I understand the other team may look and say, we want a pitcher. Remember the phrase? Not a belly itcher. Remember that? <laughs> that's how you always mock the other team. Yeah, I was good at that in baseball. But it, it doesn't matter whether he can pitch or not. He's our pitcher. He's been given that position of pitcher. And whether he can throw the ball, whether he throws it instead of the home plate to second base, because he doesn't know what's going on, none of that matters. He's our pitcher because he has that position. Likewise, when Christ calls us into himself, he declares us to be sinless before God. He says, it's gone. I've cleansed you. And now before God, you are clean. That's your position that's your positional sanctification. You are set apart as perfectly clean before God. You say, but I continue to sin. Yes, you do. So do I. But I am still positionally sinless before God. Just as Rex continues to throw the ball to second base instead of home plate, he's still our pitcher, and I'm not pulling him. And by the way, if God has given you that position, do you think he's going to change his mind and pull you out of that position? What can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. That's the answer. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. When he gives you that positional sanctification, it's yours for eternity. You will always be in that position of sanctification, of being holy and righteous and blameless and sinless before God. What a wonderful theological truth positional sanctification is. Some of you may be wondering, are you going to preach to the husbands today? <laughs> yes, here we go. Husbands, our love for our wives must be for this purpose. If you are married to an unbelieving spouse, your love for your wife ought to be to draw her to Jesus Christ to draw her to him. That ought to be the driving force if you're married to an unbeliever. But husbands, if you're married to a believing spouse, you ought to treat your wife like Christ treats you. Husband, don't answer this question, but think in your own mind, when's the last time you threw something in your wife's face that she did in the past? That ought never happen. Husbands, you should forget her sin as Christ forgot your sin. It's removed. If she's in Christ, it's gone. Don't ever throw sin in your wife's face. That is not loving your wife as Christ loved the church. No, husbands, love your wives in a way 
that you remind her regularly she's not under condemnation from God nor from you, but that her sin is done, her sin against you is done, that's okay. You say, well, she continues to sin. Recognize her in Christ as sinless. That doesn't mean that there's not a place to confront sin when there's serious offense, just like the wife does, and we talked about that underneath the wife and the subjection to wife. There's a place for her to confront her husband. There's a place for her husband to confront his wife. But so many marriages are ruined by bitterness, ruined by past sin that somebody refuses to get over, refuses to forgive, refuses to forget. Husbands, if you struggle to forget your wife's sin, remember this, you sinned against Christ today, this morning already, and he's already forgotten it. What is your problem? You are called to love your wife that way. You can obey? Forget your wife's sin. Put it behind you. It's done and over with. Just as Christ throws it behind his back, you throw your wife's sin behind your back and you honor her as Christ does if she is in Christ. That's purpose number one. Purpose number two is found in the beginning of verse 27, the first part of verse 27. This is the second hinna. The first word there is hinna. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I want to illustrate this by doing the reverse. Let's say this morning we're going to have a wedding, and the groom comes forward and stands up here, and we await the prelude's playing, and suddenly the music shifts. You've been to these weddings, I assume. Da, 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 da. And the preacher says, all rise. Don't do it. But all rise. You don't need to rise this morning. We don't have a bride coming down. And you all turn to the back, and the doors fling open, and, and here comes the bride. And, and, and those of you may be sitting out towards the windows, don't see her right away because, you know, you're trying to look around everybody to see her. But those in the back corner see it immediately. And you start to hear a gasp. <gasps> and what's going on? What does what, what she look like? And she's in a dress that was supposed to be white, but she's obviously soiled it. It's yellow, maybe gray, it's splattered with all kinds of whatever. You can, all I will tell you is this, that there's something about her that you're like, she's been doing things she ought not to have been doing as a bride. She is not pure. Her, her dress is torn and wrinkled in such a way that you're, she was doing something terrible within that dress. This is not a pure bride. Imagine the groom. You turn after seeing this. What is his reaction? And you see tears streaming down his face as he is crushed by seeing that what he's receiving as a bride is not a pure and radiant and glorious bride. I would suggest to you that many men would stop the ceremony right there and say, what is going on? Would they not? No, I, I, I didn't, I don't know what you've been doing last night. Well, I don't know what your bachelorette party was like, but something's not right. But Christ, with his bride, the church, that's not going to happen. He's presenting the church to himself as spotless. Imagine again, you look to the back and she walks in as probably 99.9, .9, hopefully 100%, of the weddings that you have attended have all white dress. Maybe it's not all white because it was intended to be a different color. That's okay too. I just know tradition. And it's beautiful and it's modest and she's glowing. You got the picture. She's glowing because a bride glows. She radiates. There's glory coming off of her face. And now you turn and look at the groom, and, and if he was like me, he was still had tears coming down his face, but with a huge smile on his face. Because <laughs> I cried like a baby when I watched my wife walk down the aisle. But out of joy, because she was radiant and beautiful 
and pure. That's what Christ desires in his bride. And he desires her to be that way all the time. And so, Christ is changing his church day by day. It would be as though Rex, our pitcher, remember our pitcher? It would be as though Rex, he's always throwing a second base, and maybe the first thing I say is, Rex, turn around. See that guy there squatting? That's who you're going to throw to. And, and he starts to get that right. But now he throws it all over the place. Okay, Rex, keep your eyes on his glove. Wherever the glove is, that's where you're aiming for. And then I have to tell him how to point his toe and how to bring his arm over the top. And, and I train Rex so that he's not just in the position of pitcher, but he begins to look like a pitcher. He begins to act like a pitcher. He begins to have the knowledge of a pitcher. And he's changed into a real pitcher. You say, well, he's probably going to still miss the strike zone sometimes. Yes, he will. He will err. But there's a big difference between if I were to pitch a game, and I don't know any of the famous pitchers today, but pick your favorite one on the Cleveland In Guardians. <laughs> I'm going to say Indians anyway. I don't care. I'm not a Cleveland fan either way, but I know that frustrates many of you. But pick your favorite pitcher on your favorite team. There's a big difference between me and him. I kind of have an idea. My shoulder's not so good. But I at least know which way to throw it. I, I, but, I mean, they'd be hitting home runs off of me left and right. But that guy's trained and been disciplined for years how to pitch. But how many pitchers pitch a perfect game? And if they get one, how many get another one? <laughs> I mean, to get one in a lifetime is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. To get multiple perfect games would be really amazing. But to pitch every game perfectly doesn't happen. That's unrealistic. Well, Christian, you're in the position of sinless, but you're not going to pitch perfectly. You're going to err. But Christ is changing you and training you and disciplining you and coaching you by his word, by his church, by prayer to cause you to live that sinless life more and more so that your life begins to be characterized as your position is. I said characterized. I didn't say perfectly. Can I ask you something? If Christ loved his church and gave himself for it, not just to positionally sanctify her, but to sanctify her day by day, is he going to do it? Yes. You know, this text here teaches something that's important for the church to understand. That when God, and I've preached this many times, we'll say it again, when God saves someone, that same grace that saves you is grace that also changes you. God doesn't save people. Christ didn't give his life just to take you to heaven, just to bring you salvation. Christ died and gave himself for you to change you into being more like him here on earth, into living out that sinlessness here on earth more and more day by day as you grow in Christ. The idea that someone can be saved and have no change of life is a falsehood. It's a lie from Satan. Many in the church have believed this, that there are people who are saved, but they're not changed. That is what I would call an idea of weak grace. God's grace is not weak. It is strong. It is, if it's strong enough to save you, it's strong enough to change you. The love of Christ, he gave himself for that. Not just to take you to heaven, but to transform your life here. That's why he gave himself. That's why he loves the church. To that end, to save her, yes. To sanctify her positionally, yes. But then he's going to sanctify her progressively, or you could say practically, 
either one. Progressive sanctification. What is that? That's the training. That's the discipline that causes you to live differently. Progressive sanctification happens primarily through the word of God. As he changes you a little bit more every day. Now I said you won't reach perfection in this life. In fact, we'll get to the perfecting moment in a moment. But you're not going to arrive here. But are you being changed? Look back when you first got saved. Are you the same person? I don't mean you just added more wrinkles and lost more hair. I mean, are you a different person than you were? Are you a different person than you were a year ago or three years ago? This progressive sanctification happens in the life of a believer. And those who are in Christ know that. We see it. We see it in our lives. And it's a great test for the believer to say, am I in Christ? Am I being changed? His grace is powerful enough to change. That's progressive or practical sanctification. It means that you're progressing in your sanctification towards that sinless life, even though you won't arrive here. Or you could say practical sanctification because it's working out in your life. You are positionally sinless before God, but now you're practically living out more of a sinless life day by day as sin is tossed aside and as your mind's renewed and as you learn what Christ desires and you say, I'm going to chase after that and I'm going to let go of some of the things in my past. Husbands, love your wives with the goal of her being pure for you. Notice how he says here in verse 27 that he might present to himself the church. Husbands, it benefits you to love your wife towards sanctification because you don't want your wife to shame you, do you? You desire your wife to be pure, to be spotless for your own benefit. It says, as Christ desires to present himself a bride that's pure, husbands, you ought to desire the same thing. Go back to that groom. Is he, the one is shameful, but when the white pure bride comes in, he's proud, isn't he? She's being presented to me. We ought to desire that in our lives of our wives, husbands. And so I ask you this morning, husband, are you Keeping your wife pure. Are you keeping your wife pure? What, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by keeping your wife pure? Well, we know that today in our society, pornography runs rampant. We know it's everywhere. Do you know there's couples that watch pornography together? That's impurity. I heard an account recently, I mean, I think the account was years ago, but I heard it recently, of a pastor who was on a show that said he and his wife watch pornography together because it spices their marriage up. Husbands, that's bringing impurity into your marriage. Don't do that. You're, you're, you're making your wife filthy. You're throwing mud on her dress. You're staining her. Don't, no. Be careful what you put in front of your bride. Other movies, other shows that maybe say we ought to not watch this. That's impure, and I want a pure bride. We should be seeking husbands to love our wives to purity. Do you love your wife such that, let me preface that before I finish that statement. A wife is responsible for her own sin. Let me say that clearly. A wife is responsible for her own sin. We all are responsible for our own sin. Do we agree with that? I'm responsible for my sin. I don't get to blame anybody else. Somebody else might do something that I react wrongly to. I'm responsible for the poor reaction. Does that make sense? That other individual is responsible for what they've done. So I want to say that first before I say what I was going to say. Husbands, do you love your wife in such a way that she would never want to stray? In a way that satisfies her. In every aspect that you can satisfy her. Now I know she might chase after selfish desires and we'll, we'll address that in a moment, but 
Do you meet the needs of your wife such that a husband ought to meet? You say, you're talking about sex here? I'm talking about a lot more than that, but yes, that's included. Do you meet the needs of your wife in every aspect, in all that you can provide for her as a husband? Are you meeting her needs so that she may never be tempted? She may choose to anyway, but she would not be tempted by your lack of meeting her needs to go try to find her needs to be met elsewhere. Now, she should always find her needs met in Christ, which means if you don't meet her needs, she still should say, well, then I still have my needs met because I have Christ. And she would never be excused from any behavior that she would commit. But husbands, we've got a duty to meet the needs of our wives as husbands and love her in that direction. Does Christ meet all of our needs? You can answer that. Does Christ meet all of our needs? Yes. I have everything I need in Christ. He meets all of my needs. Husbands, love your wives like that so you meet all of her needs that she doesn't lack. Christ meets all of our needs. Why shouldn't I meet all of my wife's needs if I'm going to love her as Christ loves the church. I didn't say her wants. I didn't say her every desire. In fact, does Christ meet all of your wants? No. Until we start to get to the point where we say, your will, not mine, be done, then he does meet all of my wants because everything I have is of his hand by his will and my will is lined up with his will. And then that's when I start to conform my mind to say, this is what I want even though it's not what I was looking for. When we pray, we agree with God. And then we come to the final clause in the end of verse 27. But that she would be holy and blameless. Now that sounds a lot like the previous clause, spotless without wrinkle, but I want you to notice the little bit of difference that Paul makes here. In, in the second clause, he says to present to himself the church. Who is Christ doing it for there in that purpose? For who? Himself. Christ is doing it for Christ. But notice in the third clause that she would be holy and blameless. Christ is sanctifying his church also for the church. That she would be holy and blameless Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. We've seen this phrase before in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless, same words, before him in love. You can flip over to Colossians. It's just a couple of books further back in your Bible. Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. Chapter 1. We could go to a number of scriptures, but we'll, we'll just go to this one too. Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. But now he reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you before him, that's God, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Nothing can come into God unless it is holy and blameless. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and a few people come to the Father. No. No man, no man, no woman comes to the Father except through who? Through him, through Christ. No one does. Jesus, his third purpose is to bring us to the Father. In order to bring us to the Father, he has to present us to the Father holy and blameless. Not just positionally. And progressively, we won't get there. So in the moment of our death, we are perfectly sanctified. Perfect sanctification. 
He makes us perfectly holy and blameless. The, the other word that you would use for that most of the time would be glorification. Glorification. I, I, I like perfect sanctification. That way it's a P. Or perpetual sanctification. We will be perpetually holy and blameless before God for all eternity. There will never be a time when we're in glory that we're not holy and blameless. Because if there were, we'd have to be gone. But the love of Christ will keep us there for all eternity before God. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to positionally sanctify her, to progressively sanctify her, and to perpetually sanctify her in glory forever with God forever. And this, my friends, benefits you, doesn't it? If he makes you holy and blameless, now you can be before God. If he doesn't make you holy and blameless, you cannot be in the presence of God. You see, the, first, the second clause, he presents you to himself. Now he's presenting you to the Father, and you get the benefits. Men, you're to love your wife to purity for her benefit. Not just so that you're not ashamed as a husband, but so that she's not ashamed as a woman, as a child of God. For her benefit, husband, she is your primary disciple. Do you know that? Husbands, your wife is your primary disciple. I shared before, I've heard of men in ministry that neglected their home and they pursued ministry and they grew big ministries or went to the mission field to some foreign field and, and, and all these salvations. And God can certainly use anybody for that, can't he? That's how wonderful our God is. But if these men have forsaken their families, and some have, they were not doing it for the Lord they were doing it for themselves because if you do it for the Lord, your first disciple will be your wife, husband. She will be your priority to disciple her to Christ. And you will love her until either you or her are glorified. You will love her till death do you part because glorification that holiness and blamelessness doesn't happen until we're with him for eternity. In the meantime, it's just a progression. Does that make sense? But in the end, it's final. And we are completely holy and blameless before God. I want to just give a few more thoughts overall to this text, primarily to husbands. Although the church can learn a lot, I hope you learn some good theology today, some good doctrine today. But husbands, if you are going to participate in leading your wife to sanctification, then you yourself must be sanctified. You are not going to disciple your wife to be more like Christ if you yourself are not becoming more like Christ, husband. Men who are thinking about being husbands one day, consider this, the best, the best thing you can do for your wife is become like Christ, is to be sanctified by the word of Christ, is to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And, and I know this takes hard work and this takes sacrifice. Well, guess what? You have not sacrificed like Christ sacrificed to sanctify you. You haven't even begun to sacrifice in light of what Christ gave up. I want to watch the football game. I want to go hunting. I want to go fishing. I don't know. I want to work on the car. I don't know what you desire to do, but there's nothing more important than your personal sanctification for your marriage and for your wife. That's the purpose you can't fulfill the purpose of God and Christ and loving your wife if you yourself are not being sanctified. So husbands, before you start to work on your wife's sanctification, are you working on your sanctification? 
your progressive sanctification? Are you progressively being sanctified by the word? Are you allowing Christ to have his work and his way in you? Are you taking advantage of all of the graces God gives to sanctify us? I mentioned him earlier, the grace of the word of God. Do you know that's a gift of God, his word? It's a grace of God to help us on this journey of sanctification. Do you know prayer is a grace of God? I've been challenged recently in the area of prayer. I, I, I gotta work on my prayer life. But I gotta understand more. It's a grace of God for me to pray. It's a gift of God for me to go before his throne. And it changes me. It's a grace given to help me change. The church is a place given for you to come together, hear the preaching of the word, interact with one another, be encouraged by other believers, stir up love and good works among one another so that you might change. And that's all a grace of God. I think sometimes we think church or reading our Bible or prayer is a duty. Oh, it's a duty. <laughs> it's work. I'm not saying it's easy all the time. I'm not saying it doesn't take discipline. I'm not saying you don't have to think about it. I'm saying it is work. But if we understood it was a grace of God, we would find joy in the work because Christ is doing his work in us and through us by his Holy Spirit as we participate in it. Husbands, sanctify you. Be sanctified. Husbands, I would also say your job is not to give your wife all of her own, all of her selfish desires. I said that earlier. Christ didn't come to fulfill our lusts and desires. You know, in Ephesians 2, when we talk about we're dead in our trespasses and sins, he says, you were going after your own desires, the lust of the mind and the lust of the flesh. That's what you were pursuing when Christ saved you and made you alive. He didn't save you so you could continue on chasing after your own desires and your own lusts. He saved you to transform your desires. And so therefore, when we love our wives, husbands, it's not so we can make her into a princess. Sorry, wives. We're not here to give you every desire and everything you want, and then you're frustrated and mad. No, that's not why we exist. So husbands, don't, don't feed the wife's flesh in that sense, but to fulfill her needs. And her greatest need is sanctification as well. And so to help her be sanctified. And by the way, yes, fulfilling needs means providing. It does. He who does not care for his own household, his relatives, and especially those of his own household, God says he's worse than an unbeliever. In other words, I'll tell you this, if a man doesn't care for his own household, I don't consider him a Christian. If he doesn't care for his own household, I don't even consider him a believer because the Bible says he's worse than an unbeliever. If he's worse than an unbeliever, that means he's not a believer. And I've known too many men that haven't done that. But you're not here to give her all her desires. You don't have to work longer hours so that she can have the car she wanted. And No, 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 no. Love her to sanctification. Don't think giving her things is the way to love her. Next week, we're going to transition into the next part of the text. But I want to get us started this morning as we close in John chapter 17. Paul is saying something here that he will say a little bit in the next text, but he doesn't say it blatantly, but I believe that the Ephesian church understood it because he would have taught them this prayer of Jesus, I believe, when he was with them. John chapter 17, this is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. If you've not spent time in the high priestly prayer of Jesus, I would encourage you to do so. If you want to know how Jesus prayed for you 2,000 years ago. It's in here, in John chapter 17. It's an amazing text, and it gives us great insight into Christ and his love. We're going to start in verse 16, John chapter 17, verse 16. We're just going to interrupt and jump right here. Jesus says, they are not of the world. He's talking about his disciples. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Here's the verse I've quoted to you about a thousand times in the last few weeks. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. For their sake, I sanctify myself 
that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. And then here's where he shifts and prays for us. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, the disciples, but for those also who believe in me through their word. I love that verse because Jesus said, I don't ask for just Peter, James, John, and Bartholomew and these guys. I'm asking for Sean and Diane and Leanne and Gloria and Tanya and Lou. And I'm just, I'm asking for all of these who would believe in what they share. I love that. Jesus, when he was on earth, prayed for you. And now he ever lives to make intercession for us still today. He's still praying for you. What's he pray? 21. That they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfect in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me, even as you or love them even as you have loved me. Christ loved us and gave himself for us to make us one with him, with the Father, and with one another. Genesis 2.24, the definition of marriage. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and his father and shall cleave or cling, grab a hold, glue himself to his wife. And the two shall become what? One flesh. Husband, I want to close with this. It is your duty, husband, to love your wife to oneness. You notice in Genesis 2.24, we didn't talk about this much, but who is being instructed in that? The husband is. The husband leaves his father and his mother. The husband clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Do you see that? Who's doing the action in those? The husband is doing the action. Now, I'm not saying it, takes, it still takes two to tango. We know that, right? I'm not a tango, but I've, I've never done a tango. But we know it takes two. So, I mean, husbands, I understand you can love your wife perfectly and she can resist that and you can't bring her to oneness. But I will tell you this, that it is your primary duty to love your wife to this oneness if possible. It's your primary duty to love your wife to this one flesh union. Because that's what Christ did for us. It was his love and his sacrifice that brought us into oneness with him, wasn't it? It was his giving of himself. Husbands, you are called to give yourself to this oneness. Give yourself to it. Give yourself up. Thank God for the love of Christ who calls us into oneness together. Amen? Father, we thank you so much for the gift of Christ. We thank you for the love of Christ. And we thank you for him giving himself. This task you have put before each husband, me being one of them. Father, to me, some days seems monumental because I have fallen short so much in loving my wife. And I'm not just talking about years ago. I'm talking about this week because I have yet to love her as Christ loves the church. But Father, on behalf of every husband here this morning, I want to say thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for the love of Christ that motivates us to keep moving forward in this so that we might be one with our wives. And Father, thank you 
that you are the impetus, you are the motivator, you are the one that propels us on. It is only by the strength of the Holy Spirit that we make any progress at all. We are helpless and hopeless, except that we have Christ, and so now we're sinless and blameless before you. What an awesome God you are. We glory in your great name, even as we continue to sing this morning together. In Jesus' name, amen.